Uh, Eric Sosamski, I'm an interventional cardiologist, vascular interventionalist at Beth Israel in Boston. And I was charged for the CFA session, which is our current session, uh, talking about superastenting um, and an update on a, a prospective study of superastenting in the CFA. Um, these are my disclosures. So, and for all the vascular surgeons in the room, I ask you to put some earmuffs on because we always talk about common femoral endurectomy as the gold standard. And that's because we've had some really good long-term outcomes reported over five to 15 years. And you can see a summary of some of the landmark studies. These are over a decade old now, but you know most of these are single, single center, collection of patients, 158, 111 patients who also great patency rates over the long term. But you know it's not all positive. And, and we also know there's a dark side to any type of invasive procedure, but also surgical procedure. And so on the dark side of common femoral endorectomies, the complication rates, which can be anywhere between 6.6% and in some sites um, up to 17%. And obviously there's a lot of surgical dependence here, operator dependence and local practice patterns. But this was a nice study that came out in 2015 um, that looked at um, 1,843 common femoral endorectomies. Um, and they had a reported 30-day mortality rate of 3.4%. Um, and then again, we see the range uh, was a little bit lower in prior studies and 15% combined mortality and major complication rates. So, you know, I think that although the efficacy is, is proven and durable, that we do have to be mindful of those patients who are at higher risk, high risk for complications, and that these are not always benign procedures. So, you know, there's been a number of um, attempts to demonstrate the endovascular approach for common femoral um, artery stenosis. And here is a um, study out of the VQI, the Vascular Quality Initiative. I mean, it looked at all their common femoral and, and profunda interventions from 2010 to 2015, totaling over 1,000 um, peripheral vascular interventions. Again, this is a surgical database. Um, and the majority of the interventions were a balloon angioplasty alone, and this is before drug-coated balloons were really on the market. Um, but about a quarter of them got stents, and you can see about one in five got an atherectomy. And at one year, the survival rate was good, 92.9%. Um, the amputation-free survival rate was very good, 93.5%. But there was some a moderate patency um, and reintervention rates in the mid-80s. And so the conclusion for the study was safe to do an endovascular approach for common femoral, but there also is patency that's different than you'd see, <coughs> excuse me, which is the surgical approach. We also saw not too long ago the TICO trial, which was a unique randomized trial, which we don't get a lot of in the peripheral vascular space, that looked at common femoral endorectomy versus a self-expanding stent. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why maybe this wasn't the right um, treatment arm from the endovascular standpoint, but this was a 17-center study. Um, and they had kind of an a, a odd primary outcome, which was primarily a, a mortality and morbidity complications, which obviously would favor an uh, endovascular approach at 30 days. But I'll just point your attention to the primary outcome um, occurred in 26% in the common femoral group, 12.5% in the stenting group. And if you look over in, in panel B on the patency side in my, in my Kaplan-Meier curves here, you can see TLR rates up to two years were pretty similar between surgical approach and stenting with a self-expanding stent. Um, again, there were some important exclusions in this trial. And again, using a self-expandable stent um, was unique to the design, but just again, showed some more randomized data now saying that an endovascular approach for common femoral diseases, it's not unreasonable when we're also considering the complications and risk to our patient. But we also know that maybe these type of stents are, are complicated and this whole SFA is really a complex beast in itself. And this is a, a really nice um, diagram of, of the flexion and, and, and you know, torsion that occurs with, with your, your um, SFA artery. Um, and it's just dynamic. It depends on how you hold your leg, how you cross your legs, your age, your lesion characteristics. And this is the view of the leg bent. And you can see that the forces on both the distal SFA as well as near the common femoral uh, makes it very challenging to identify what's the right stent choice for each of these lesion locations. And then I think that's where uniquely superas come into play for this type of intervention. Um, we've heard a little bit about supera earlier in the morning, uh, but really it's a unique stent design. It's an interwoven nitinol stent, and it maintains as much of the natural behavior and function of the vessel um, as, as possible for any of the stents that are on the market. This also allows us to uh, <coughs> minimize vessel injury and avoid uh, fracture. And so it's a unique opportunity to use the stent in an artery like the common femoral where we might need to reaccess it, where there might be, again, flexion extension points that can cause stent fracture. 
um, and also unique um, issues with um, the inguinal ligament and other components of the of the region. So the VMI CFA trial, um, and these are results from Cohen Deleuze, who presented these uh, in 2019, um, was a prospective single arm study of 100 patients mm -hmm. um, that were followed for two years. And really, they were looking at a 12 month endpoint based on ultrasound, a PSVR of less than 2.5, um, and then also paraprocedural endpoints. And you can see this azema criteria here of the different different types of common femoral disease and the inguinal ligament how it crosses. And so this study focused really on the B and C. So kind of the distal common femoral below the inguinal ligament, and then also um, disease ex extending into the profunda. So um, I'm sorry for the quality of this, but you can see out of the 100 patients randomized, they're primarily male. Um, their average age was 72, and they had the usual amount of comorbidities you expect for a peripheral vascular study. About 79% were claudicans, 21% CLI, and this circle in the middle demonstrates the breakdown of the um, RF classifications, 58% being in the, in the RF3. You can see the uh, nicely represents our, our patients, 44 millimeters in length lesions and reference vessel diameter of 7.3. And all 100 patients had technical success with an endovascular intervention in this study. Again, all of this was superior stents. The majority required only one stent. About 2% received two stents. Um, and the average uh, post-dilatory -dil uh, stent size um, was 7.3 millimeters. Um, so it was a, a very good result here. And you can see the outcome. So this is the Kaplan-Meier curves at one and two years. So again, superistent, common femoral, 95.2% patency at one year, 92.8% patency at two years. So quite impressive results. Again, I showed you that early experience where they were more in the 83 to 85% range. Um, this is now approaching what was uh, has been reported for common femoral endorectomy. When you break this down by azema type B and C, you again see that pretty much that patency is preserved irrespective of the location of the common femoral artery disease. This is the TLR and TVR rates also. So now looking at um, um, target lesion revascularization in the top left, target vessel revascularization in the bottom right, and target lesion revascularization remained really impressively right around 98%. The target vessel rec rec uh, revascularization uh, dipped at the second year down to 84%. And most importantly, and um, you know, there's very, very few complications with this approach. Um, you can see zeros across the board here. Clinical driven TLR was one of the um, um, complication uh, events, and there was two events at one year and, and, and persisted to two years. So, you know, my take home from the data is there's no one size fits all for common femoral artery disease. You know, I very frequently refer for endorectomy. Um, I've also moved more aggressively into an endovascular approach for patients who are particularly high risk, who are, have comorbidities um, and other, uh, other reasons not to undergo a surgical procedure. I think if you are approaching a common femoral lesion, there are options. Um, some of them might be drug-coated balloon approach. Some might be stenting. And if you are stenting, I think Supera is the right stent due to its crush resistance. It's repuncturable. Um, and that patency outcome seen in this study was quite impressive. There is the SuperSurge RCT trial that has been ongoing. Um, you know, and this has been a ran it's a randomized trial, one to one of 286 patients. We haven't heard an update from this um, for a little bit of time, but I know it's still in process, and I think it will better answer this question. Um, looking at a an, an, uh, surgical uh, um, randomization arm compared to the Separa stent. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>